Yo, what's good? Big Z here. I hope everyone's having a great New Year's. You guys have been asking me to make this video for a while now, so here we are. So there's really no rules when it comes to ordering effects when you're making music. But when you are just adding a ton of different effects to all your tracks when you're making a song, you should definitely still be mindful of the order those effects are in. If you understand how your signal chain works, you'll be able to use that to your advantage and maybe make some creative effects out of it that you wouldn't normally have thought of. Just to understand the signal chain real quick, let's say you have a vocal, like I have this vocal sample right here. So it's got four different effects on it. It's got a de-esser, it's got this pitch shifting plugin, then it's got a compressor, and then it's got some reverb all on there. So what's really happening here is this dry vocal signal back here is going into the first plugin first, the de-esser. But that dry vocal signal isn't going into the second plugin on the chain. The audio that's going into that second plugin, the pitch shifting plugin, is the audio that's coming out of the de-esser. I'm gonna show you some examples of why the ordering of effects matters. I'm gonna make the effects a lot more drastic than I normally would just so you can hear the difference between everything. So in this example, I have the same vocal with some pitch shifting and then a ton of reverb on it. Maybe you'd wanna use it as like an airy backdrop in your track. Right now, the pitch shifting is before the reverb and the signal chain, but if I move the reverb before the pitch shifting, then the reverb would go in first, and then afterwards, that reverb signal would be pitch shifted. and pitch shifters are really bad at picking up the pitch of a signal that has a ton of reverb on it. That's why it sounds so bad when you put the reverb before the pitch shifter. It sounds much cleaner when you put it after. Another example would be compression and delay. So first on this channel strip, I have a compressor that's heavily compressing the vocal, and then I have a delay. So I'm just gonna bounce this to audio so you'll be able to see the difference in the tracks. So I've bounced that first one. Now I'm gonna go back and switch these plugins around so I put the delay before the compressor and now I'm gonna bounce that. So you can actually tell the difference in this one just by looking at the bounced audio signals right here. In the version with the compressor before the delay, it sounds a little more natural. I've been thinking about you. And the delay doesn't last that long. But then if I have the delay before the compressor, then the compressor is really compressing that delayed signal and making it last a lot longer. I've been thinking about you. See how much longer the delay lasts this time? Two, two, two. So there's no right or wrong answer when it comes to ordering things. It just depends on what kind of effect that you're going for. I'll do a couple more quick examples. So what happens if we have a de -esser and then an EQ that's boosting the high end a lot. So what I'll do is bounce the de before the EQ first, and then I'll make another version where I bounce the EQ before the de -esser. Let's see the difference between them. So the de before the EQ actually sounds a lot brighter than the other way around. That's because when you have the EQ first, it's sending this super bright signal I've been thinking about you. into the de -esser. So then the de has to work harder. I've been thinking about you. So immediately it goes to maximum attenuation, I've been thinking which is minus 16 decibels, where if I switch it around, I've been thinking about you. The de doesn't have to work as hard. As you can see in the beginning, it's doing 12 decibels of gain reduction. I've been thinking about you. And then the end, it goes down to 16 for that CH sound. But the point is that it makes the de work a lot harder when you have the EQ before the de making the signal brighter. All these same concepts hold true in the serum effects rack. So like in this sound, if I was working on this bass sound, I've put the compressor before the distortion, so the compressed signal is feeding down into the distortion. But if I were to switch that around, it would distort the signal first, then compress it. Which makes it sound a lot different.
So lastly, I just want to touch on the question of EQ before compression or compression before EQ. People are wondering all the time which one they should do. And the answer is, it really depends what you're going for. I personally like to do compression then EQ. I feel like compression sometimes amplifies the resonant harsh frequencies of a sound. So if I compress a sound first, it makes it easier for me to hear those harsh frequencies and then I can EQ them out after the compression. If I were to do the EQ first and then do the compression, the compression could be amplifying some harsh frequencies that I don't want to hear. So I'd end up having to do another EQ after that compressor. So that's why I like to do compression before EQ. I know I just did a lot of simple examples here with like two effects on each track. And in the real world, in a song, you could have like 15 effects on one track. So in that case, you really just need to be paying attention to what signal is coming out of a plugin and going into the next plugin on the chain. And if you're not sure, you can just keep experimenting, moving around the plugins, and see what sounds best to you. Anyway, I hope this was helpful to some of you guys. Make sure to follow me on Instagram and Spotify below. Other than that, I'll catch you guys next time. Peace.